All right, Nintendo, Blue Buddy, we need to talk. So that. Timeline is one of the longest running topics I've covered on this channel. And after all of that time, there's still one game that I've yet to fit into this thing. It's the small little independent spin Presenting an independent spin off called The Epic of Stew. The Epic of Stew? Okay, never heard of it before. The underappreciated adventure of yet another green clad hero of legend out to save a princess. True right. to its name, this game was pretty epic. <laughs> Stu could battle his way through a whopping five intense levels of copyright right. neutral Octoroks and Tektites. Copyright neutral, awesome. Until finally reaching the princess, and then he had to complete a dating simulation at the end to woo her. I mean, she can't just go along with any errant knight who comes her way after all. Wait, wait. It just went from an uh, adventure game, adventure genre to a uh, dating genre. What? Oh. You know, the two people who created this game, they're probably out to do some. That piece was to a com science, uh, a com science for. Pro final project by Matthew Factory and Stephanie. Oh, Pretty great things together. And hey, if nothing else, at least it was better than the CDI games. Oh. <laughs> Just a quick note on that opening gag, by the way. Epic of Stew was a game created Aww. by Stephanie and I. It was actually our first ever group project together, and we've been working on group projects together ever since. Uh, wow, both of them look so young. And the hairstyle is a bit... <laughs> Yeah, mm. you can see the itch. Anyway, hello internet! Welcome to Game Theory, uh, the show that has no problem going back and rethinking the Zelda timeline. Just like Nintendo, apparently. Yeah, in case you haven't heard, the timeline, it changed yet again. According to the Hyrule Historia, which was the definitive source for all things Zelda lore for a while, Link's Awakening used to come after Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons. But in the most recent Legend of Zelda Encyclopedia, released just last year as the third and final installment in what's known as the Goddess Trilogy of Canonical Zelda lore books, Link's Awakening now comes before Oracle of Ages and Seasons. Blasphemy! Over-exaggerated outrage! Hashtag cancel Zelda! Seriously though, it's an odd change, certainly, but nothing too important, right? I mean, it's not like they invalidated the concept of a definitive timeline existing at all, right? Oh wait, yeah, that's exactly what they did. On the bottom of the page, right there for all of us to see, quote, Attentive readers may note that the timeline shown here differs slightly from the one found in Hyrule Historia. Mm. Differ slightly from the Hyrule Historia. Slightly. The timeline can be interpreted a number of ways and may change depending on new discoveries that may come to light and on the player's imagination, end quote. So you see, it's basically telling us that Nintendo does what Nintendo wants. <laughs> Nintendo does what Nintendo wants. Nintendo is a restaurant. Uh, yeah, true, true. So, Imagination. Any moment, Nintendo could just hit shuffle on the Zelda franchise and just announce a new version of the timeline. <laughs> new! Just because they made some new discovery. What does that even mean? You guys know all this stuff. You program these games. Or what? Are you waiting on us to discover the deep lore myths here? Because let me tell all you guys at Nintendo, get ready to re-re-re-release this thing. Because Hey, listen! 
Read, read, read. Because I've made some new discoveries, and I've let my imagination run wild, and their combined forces are about to drop a bombshell on your timeline. Oh. You ready for it, Nintendo? Get this. Hyrule Warriors, a game that you have gone on record time and time again to say that isn't canon, should, in fact, be considered canon, and may, in fact, be the single most important missing piece in your entire timeline. It is the game that, quite frankly, solves everything corrects every problem and challenge that this thing has. So as you guys start revving up the hype train for Breath of the Wild 2, the breath just got wilder, and as the internet continues to salivate over rehydrated Ganon, consider this theory a pitch. A solution to the problem you created for yourself when it comes to this timeline. A way for me to contribute to a game series that I have loved for my entire life. Shall we begin? Here's a little bit of context for those of you who don't know what the problem is. In addition to changing up the order of a few games and adding the addendum of imagine some- Imagine something and if it's good enough, we'll make it canon. <laughs> um, seriously? Seriously? Thing, and if it's good enough, we'll make it canon. There was one other big announcement Nintendo made about the Zelda timeline. They named the placement of Breath of the Wild. Oh. It's drumroll please. At the end. Surprising literally no one, they chose to place it down here ish, vaguely somewhere at the bottom. Disconnected ish. from literally everything else but sitting right down here. As they said in an interview translated by Silicon Era, well, of course it's at the very end. But I get what you're asking. It's which timeline is it the end of? That's up to the player's imagination, isn't it? Hyrule's history changes over time. When we think of the next game and what we want to do with it, we might think, oh, this will fit well and place it neatly into the timeline. But sometimes we think, oh crap, and have to change the placement. Actually, the decided history has been tweaked many times. So really, they gave us a grand total of zero answers that we were actually <laughs> looking for. But you know what? Like I said earlier, I'm going to give you guys a reason to tweak it again. Remember that at the end of Ocarina of Time, Hyrule's story actually splits in three directions depending on if Link wins or loses against Ganon in the quest. The first timeline is where Link dies, leading to Ganon's takeover and the ultimate downfall of Hyrule. This is the path of some of the darkest early games in the franchise, like the original Legend of Zelda and Link to the Past. On the happier side of the timeline spectrum, there are two separate timelines created if Link wins against Ganon. The first one follows Link as he returns to his original timeline the child timeline, leading to Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess. And the last one is made of the adult world that he leaves behind. Now, without their hero, opening the door to the likes of Wind Waker and Spirit Tracks. Now, as I covered in my last Breath of the Wild timeline episode, the biggest challenge with placing this one game in any individual segment of that timeline is that it makes reference to everything up here. There are elements of all three timelines in this one game. Now, I'm not gonna go over all the evidence that I covered last timeline episode. Trust me, I would love to, I would love to extend the watch time of this video artificially, but for the purposes of today's theory, I will refresh <laughs> you on some of the highlights, which include Breath of the Wild having Rock Salt, Koroks, and Rito, which were all left over from the great ocean we travel in Wind Waker's part of the timeline. Then cool. there's the existence of Lynels, Spectacle Rock being in the world, and a yellow-brimmed hero hat alongside the absence of Ganon's human form, which would all point towards the downfall timeline. And then finally, Zelda's passing mention of the glowing embers of Twilight in one of the memories that you end up unlocking over the course of the game, which obviously alludes to Twilight Princess and thus the child timeline. Now, that last one may sound like it's the weakest, right? And admittedly, I was a bit quick to dismiss it in the past episode, so let me just give you a bit more to chew on as far as how it relates to the child Did timeline, because shockingly, it's actually one of the strongest. In Breath of the Wild's quest, A Fragmented Monument, Link is asked to find fragments for a structure that looks exactly like the mirror of Twilight from Twilight Princess. Now, that alone would be pretty strong evidence, but we're not done. Also in that same game, Midna, ruler of the Twilight Realm, explicitly says that her people believe that the hero of legend would appear as a divine beast. And what do we have as our primary mission throughout Breath of the Wild? A quest to awaken ancient machines, all with animal themes, in order to defeat Ganon. And what are these giant animal mechs called? Divine beasts. Oh my god! Literally divine god, so divine beasts. Literally. Zelda even says, What do you think? That divine beast was actually built by people. Last- Oh! 
the divine beast will actually be by God. So if people actually worship the divine beast, the gods, that means the gods will be built by people. Lastly, huh. Breath of the Wild has the presence of a friendly, human-like Zora species. Now, that at first might seem weird for me to call out since it feels like Zora exists across all the different games equally, but when you actually look at the timeline, it isn't true. In the adult timeline, it's said that the Zora have gone extinct and have given rise to the Rito, the bird people, so no Zoras there, knocking out that part of the timeline. And then over in the downfall timeline, the Zora are no longer friendly, but have actually regressed into the form of monsters. According to the Hyrule Encyclopedia, quote, By the era of A Link to the Past, the kingdom of Hyrule is in decline, and relations with the Zora have soured greatly. Their bodies change from blue to green, and they become increasingly aggressive towards outsiders. By the era of the adventure of Link, the Zora are outright monsters, end quote. So essentially, the Zora become enemies due to the lack of communication between themselves and the Hylians. So for Breath of the Wild oh. to have friendly, highly cognitive, Zoras like we see in the game, it would need to take place in the child timeline. So honestly, there you go. Three timelines with three really solid buckets of evidence, each supporting Breath of the Wild standing at the end of each of those timelines. Which means, honestly, it's most likely intended to be the descendant of all of them. Which I totally get, that's fine. Probably what the Zelda team intended as they try to move beyond the timeline baggage of all the past games. But it still leaves us with one problem. We still have to find a way to unite the three timelines. Oh, so it's like three in one. <laughs> That'd be interesting, that'd be interesting. I mean, if Breath of the Wild is gonna exist somewhere on this somewhere. chart, which clearly Nintendo is still intending to have happen, then somehow those three timelines need to be merged together once again to produce Breath of the Wild. So how do you do that sort of thing without an end game level of time heist? This, time my friends, heist. is the missing link of the timeline. Get it? In quite a... Get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. I got a joke. Missing link. Because the person's name is literally called Link. Get it? Do you get it? <laughs> ah, that's funny literal sense. We've had our hero of time, hero of legend, hero of twilight, hero of the skies. Heck, there's even been a hero of trains because you know what? Modes of transportation need heroes too. <laughs> so who then is our hero of the multiverse? Who is the <gasps> one that brings it all together? Enter Hyrule Warriors, a game that shares a special connection between not just one, but all three of these separate timelines. A game whose entire plot revolves around multiple moments from Zelda history all merging together into one series of climactic battles. Oh my god, a multiverse. Time heist. <laughs> A game that stands to be the missing piece to connect Breath of the Wild to the rest of the timelines. For those of you who haven't played it, which is probably a lot of you since it was originally released on the Wii U, first off, the Definitive Edition is available right now on the Nintendo Switch, all DLC included, and it is great. It's a hack and slash Dynasty Warrior style action game, which means it is non-stop. So if beating up thousands of Zelda series enemies using Link's iconic weaponry after they've been roided up to the max sounds like fun to you, then Hyrule War Warriors is absolutely worth a playthrough. But more importantly for the theory today, we're not interested in the gameplay, we're here for the story. In Hyrule Warriors, there exists a sorceress named Sia. No, not that Sia. This one is tasked with maintaining the balance to the Triforce, not interpretive dance performances accompanied by catchy pop melodies and hair bows. Although I- Oh, wow. That is super accurate, if you think about it. If you think about it, just, just pause for a while, pause for a while, alright. Think about it. You get it? I have to say, they do both hide their faces quite a bit. Anyway, this task allows her to see across all timelines. The thing is, she's not supposed to interfere, but while watching the different timelines for so many thousands of years, three things always stand out to her as the constant. A spirit of darkness, a spirit of Hylia, and a hero. She eventually falls in love with the hero, but she knows that she can't have him because Zelda always shows up when darkness starts going up on the rise. This jealousy is all Ganon needs to come in, possess her, and drive a rift in her soul. Eventually 
splitting her into two different people. Lana, the righteous, good, and pure half, and Sia, the prideful, lustful, evil half. In this story, oh. Ganon's soul was broken into four fragments and scattered throughout the timelines to ensure that he couldn't be resurrected. Honestly, probably the smartest idea that anyone's ever had in a Zelda game. But because of this, he ends up manipulating Sia into merging the timelines together and gathering the pieces of his soul. TLDR here, thirsty time sorceress unites the multiverse for <coughs> So, family friendly, please, you know, keep me wholesome. Just be welcoming. Yeah, you know. <clears throat> Love, and then resurrects Ganon instead. Whoopsie! Oops. Now, you can already see where this is headed, right? In order to explain everything we see present in Breath of the Wild, we need a game to unite three timelines into one. We need an ocean to appear to produce rock salt. We need Zoras to not be evil, but also not be extinct so they can exist alongside the Rito. We need Lynels and Spectacle Rock in a world with Koroks and the Mirror of Twilight. And in Hyrule Warriors, we have exactly that. We have ourselves a game where timelines interact. But the evidence oh. doesn't just end with a simple explanation of everything got jumbled up. We also know specifically that elements of all three timelines are mixed in this one game. A game, mind you, which takes place at the end of the child timeline. We know it's at the end of the child timeline because of all the Twilight Princess references. One of the pieces of Ganon's soul is hidden in the Twilight Realm. We refight Zant from that game. It also features locations like Farron Woods before the multiverse is even introduced. A location, mind you, that only appears in Skyward Sword, Twilight Princess, and wouldn't you know it, Breath of the Wild. Now, when Sia merges the timelines, she explicitly combines the Skyward Sword era, the Twilight era, and the Era of Time. None of which would actually point us in the direction of any additional timelines merging in, since two of the three are already happening in a united timeline before the split even happens, and the third one is happening in the Child timeline, where we just established the game clearly takes place. But then you start looking a bit closer at what's in this game. By the end of it, a fourth major scenario gets mixed in. The Great Sea from the adult timeline becomes the final major quest. And while we might not outright visit an event from the Downfall timeline, it is actually present here. Throughout the game, iconic recurring bosses are called in for climactic final battles. King Dodongos, Goma, but there's one in particular that stands out. The Four-Headed Manhandla Plant. An enemy whose origins date back to the first ever Zelda title and who has, oh. ever since, appeared in games specifically specifically from the Downfall timeline. That and its appearance in Four Swords Adventures, but honestly that game shouldn't fit there in the timeline anyway, so uh, I'm choosing to ignore that one. Uh, maybe not the best plan ever. <laughs> And not only that, but we can actually find lasting effects for how the events of Hyrule Warriors carries over into Breath of the Wild. First off, the maps share some pretty striking similarities geographically with Breath of the sure. Wild. I mean, we did a whole thing on how maps in the Zelda series have a hard time staying consistent. Even the one that we ended up settling on was kinda off, but that was all- Kind of off, but still, maps are extremely, extremely, extremely important. Also because we didn't consider Hyrule Warriors as canon. There are a lot of places that stick out across these two maps, quite honestly. Oh. The Lost Woods are directly north of Hyrule Castle on both maps. Death okay. Mountain is northeast on both maps. Kakariko Village is southeast on both maps. But what I find to be particularly strange is the location of the Valley of Seers, located just northeast of Death Mountain. It's the base of operations for Sia, who- Oh, interesting who originally is in possession of the Triforce of Power. Now, what happens to be around the same location just northeast of Death Mountain in Breath of the Wild? The Spring of Power. I mean, they had an entire map to place this thing, but then they just settle on that specific spot, which has strong connections with the Triforce of Power in one and only one game, and that game happens to be Hyrule Warriors? It's a weird coincidence, if you ask me. But that's just stuff on a map, you say. How does Hyrule Warriors explain why there are items found across all timelines in Breath of the Wild? Well, like I said, in the game's epilogue, Phantom Ganon steals Sia's powers and brings the Great Sea to Hyrule. Thus, the Great Sea now exists 
exists in the same timeline as the Twilight Realm. It explains how the Rito end up in a timeline where they don't exist, and how Medley from Wind Waker ends up getting a divine beast named after her, Vameto, in a timeline where she also doesn't exist. And most importantly of all, it explains how rock salt from underneath a great sea ends up all over Hyrule that never had a great sea to begin with. It also helps explain one other inconsistency across these games, Ruto, Princess of the Zora. Ruto is okay. so revered as a legendary ruler of the Zora that she's called a sage in Breath of the Wild. A sage. <laughs> yeah. But that's kind of an issue if you stop and think about it. Ruto only becomes a sage in the adult timeline, and yet she's regarded as one on the Zora tablets in Breath of the Wild. Our clue comes from the following section from the tablet. Quote, It is said that Ruto awoke as a sage facing this foe alongside the Princess of Hyrule and the Hero of Legend. All of this gets explained away if Hyrule Warriors is truly canon, because now, in the game, an older, fully saged out Ruto literally literally fights Ganon alongside Zelda and Link. It is a thing that happens in this game and as such could totally be the thing that this Zora tablet is talking about. Let's also take a minute to look at the champion's tunic from Breath of the Wild. Its flavor text reads, quote, In ancient Hyrule, this garment could only be worn by one who had earned the respect of the royal family, end quote. Now, if we take a quick look at all the hero garbs across all the separate timelines, from the royal family. And I mean, super quick, because this is really obvious to see, there isn't a single tunic that uses the color blue in it. And no, protective rings or Zora tunics don't count since they're either accessories or completely different outfits altogether. But you know where we can see blue as a part of the hero's garb? Shouldn't come as a surprise at this point, it's the hero's tunic in Hyrule Warriors, which features an extremely similar shade of blue by way of the blue gloves and trendy scarf. This would be True. the first instance of this color ever on a chosen hero. And that's not all. Even the story of how Link gets this outfit also matches the Breath of the Wild description. At the end of one of the early missions, Link's heroic actions earn the trust of Impa in her quest to rescue Princess Zelda. And she, as a consort to the royal family, rewards him with the hero's clothes, which in turn shows complete trust in him to become the hero that Hyrule needs. Link has earned the respect of the royal family and has thus earned himself the colors, which then translates to the champion's tunic when it comes time for Breath of the Wild centuries upon centuries upon centuries later. But I do- Oh my god, that actually does make sense. Wow. Huh. Now that's interesting. Who think that there's one other interesting set of similarities here to point out? In Hyrule Warriors, we see two very distinct forms of Ganon. His normal human form, Ganondorf, as well as the pig demon, Ganon both have very specific designs. Notice the crown with five chains over his head, all leading to a central gem on the forehead. And now pay attention to the hair, super long and fiery with the beard connected up to the hairline. Now let's look at the animal form. Ganon here is a wild beast. He's a boar who truly stands and attacks on four legs. So with all that in mind, let's check out some close-ups of Ganon and Ganondorf from Twilight Princess. We have ourselves a crown with five chains leading up to a central gem on his forehead, hair that's certainly shorter, but pretty full and looking like if you waited a couple of centuries to be revived, Fire, fiery hot could end up looking like we see in Hyrule Warriors, a pig form that is truly animalistic and attacks on all fours. Now let's check out the Ganondorf from the Downfall timeline. Oh wait, we can't because he doesn't exist. Why change back to human form when you've already won? He stays a bipedal armored pig throughout the rest of that timeline. So then, how about Ganondorf over in the adult timeline, like Wind Waker? Well, he's wearing a crown, but it's definitely a different crown, and it kinda looks like he needs some Rogaine. Looking like you're kinda going bald there, buddy. So Ganon's design in Hyrule Warriors definitely seems to be a direct continuation of what we saw in Twilight Princess, which is great! It coincides with what we said about it happening in the child timeline, but admittedly it's a bit odd for a game that they are so vehemently denying to be canonical. It feels like a pretty direct connection, but they're just like, nope, shut it down. But then there's one other dot that I think's interesting and that I think wow. we can connect here. Take a look at this. It's a 
close-up of Calamity Ganon in the final moments of Breath of the Wild. You notice anything? A connected beard and hairline, red and fiery, and a crown with four chains, but room for five, all connected to a central jewel on the forehead. Or maybe oh. you're noticing the final beast form of Ganon here, which isn't a bipedal armored pig, but is instead an actual wild animal, yet again, on four legs. This, my friends, this feels very strongly as Twilight Princess's Ganon, who has a direct design connection through Hyrule Warrior. Hyrule oh. Warriors doesn't just help explain why so many timelines appear mixed up in Breath of the Wild, it is the piece that we've been missing that connects literally everything in these games. Oh my god, literally, wow! It explains some of the seemingly new out of the blue things that show up in Breath of the Wild, like Link's blue tunic that apparently belonged to champions of the past, and Ganon's wildly new form. It explains the strange occurrences scattered throughout Hyrule like the Rock Salt, the Zora Tablets, the naming of the Divine Beasts. Though Nintendo keeps claiming this game is non-canon, I'm not so sure about it anymore. Hyrule Warriors fills in nearly every gap that makes Breath of the Wild so ambiguous, and it just so happens to be the last major Zelda title that was released before Breath of the Wild totally changed everything about this series. The breadcrumbs were there the whole time, we just needed to pick them up and follow them back to where they all converged, and also get the game on a system that wasn't the Wii U, so we would actually play it. So make it official, Nintendo! <laughs> Hyrule Warriors Link is the hero of the multiverse. And interestingly enough, as a side note, if this game did suddenly become canon, you also have the inclusion of Linkle, who would be the first female Link, the first female destined hero. So oh. this game would also be woke without even realizing it, Nintendo. And hey, you know what? Sure. If I'm wrong, it came to light from my own imagination, which makes it a valid assertion anyway. Isn't isn't that right, Nintendo? Yes, from the player's imagination. To imagination. <laughs> Which is quite valid if you think about it. See why that sort of thing is frustrating? But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. And hey, if you want to see my past theory going into more detail about Breath of the Wild's placement in the Zelda timeline, stab the box to the left with your master mouse, or click the box to the right and make yourself the hero of the notification bell. Truly the most valuable hero to all of us who work on the channel. I'll see you all next week. Again, for that FNAF episode that I promised and just took longer to write than I expected. Thank you so much. Thank you. So yeah, if you do like this video, please consider to like, share, subscribe to my channel and comment down below if you find any of us. Thank you so much and do follow the more channel as well. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Hope that you like this channel. Hope that you like this video. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Thanks so much for watching this video. This video came from my YouTube channel, The Game Theorists. I'm a huge fan of my work and I hope that you will watch more of my videos. Yeah, uh, subscribe to the channel, like, share, comment, follow, show support, and I'm just a small, 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 huge fan. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Hope to see you again. Thank you. Bye. Are they ready?